Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this Saturday morning for the third session of the Hong Kong Art Gallery Association's um, Art Symposium. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Yas Mostashari Chang, Hong Kong Art Gallery Association's Community Service Chair, as well as a Partner and Director of Gallery Week in Hong Kong. This morning, we're having a talk on the topic of outside the art institution, curating new projects, new frontiers. And I'm thrilled to introduce you um, our next speaker, Ms. Ingrid Chu, who, as you may know, is a Hong Kong-born curator, writer, and the co-founder and director of Forever and Today, Inc., a nonprofit commissioning organization in New York. This will be followed by a panel discussion moderated by Ms. Chu, who will be joined by Ms. Su Kyung Lee, the senior research curator at Tate's Research Center, Asia and Asia Pacific Acquisition Committee, where uh, she leads Tate's research in modern and contemporary Asian art. Mr. Aaron Sito, the director of Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Nuzantara, Macan. Um, Mr. Dustin Shum, a Hong Kong-based documentary photographer and the co-founder and curator of The Salt Yard, an independent artist-run exhibition space dedicated to photography. We also have Ms. Selina Ting, who is a curator and specialist in contemporary art and cur currently the editor-in-chief of Kobo Social, the first Asia community platform for collectors. And finally, Mr. Septim Weber, who is an internationally recognized ballet director, choreographer, educator, and advocate. He has recently joined Hong Kong Ballet as its artistic director after 17 years as artistic director of the Washington Ballet in Washington, D.C. Um, after the um, panel discussion, there will be a performance by Hong Kong Ballet at the rooftop of, uh, of Asia Society. I welcome Ms. Chu. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me today, uh, especially the Hong Kong uh, Art Gallery Association. I'm really thrilled to be here back in my hometown after a vast number of years. Um, I've been back for about three years, but I really feel like uh, today is a reintroduction to some of my curatorial work. Uh, first, I'm not sure if the videos will play, so maybe I can play them a little. I'll give you the links. Um, but some of you may know this project. I wanted to start with it. It is a uh, project by a local artist, uh, Lam Tung Pang. And essentially, I'll, ha I'll explain it a little bit uh, since we don't have the video. He uh, basically took over an entire hotel here in, um, well, first a room, then a number of rooms, and then eventually the entire floor um, as part of a project uh, called the uh, Hometown uh, Tourist. And the, the title is a little self-referential. And I found it was really intriguing. Um, the sort of first shot is uh, when I first arrived, uh, the, the, and the first shot of this is essentially a uh, shot of the Umbrella Revolution. So, you know, and then he pans into the hotel where he's taken this over and really, um, oh, yeah, thank you. Recreated, uh, essentially, recreated essentially a, uh, his entire uh, home. He lives here, but he's transported it to this other uh, location. And I thought that was really intriguing in terms of um, it, it really introduced me to, I think, things that are still uh, influencing and, and are challenges to artists here in Hong Kong in terms of space, uh, to work, uh, to show, to live, uh, pressures of being uh, with your family. You know, he's a father. Um, how do you make work? Um, very, some very practical things. And then, of course, um, as I mentioned, sort of the, the window uh, into the greater, um, I think, pressures of the city are also reflected and, of course, have uh, he's take, literally taking the inside, and it's a metaphor for how it's um, being assumed by uh, really, you know, the artist, and then it comes back out into through his work. And I wanted to give that example um, because it's I feel like it's sort of uh, things that I'll speak to in the presentation, but then also uh, things that are really very particular to Hong Kong, and that was uh, something uh, new to me and something that as a curator I try to address in terms of how I work with artists uh, and, and, and continuing to do so uh, today through uh, different projects. But uh, I think 
to do that, I wanted to go quite far back um, in a sense, sort of create a, a methodology of sort of why I curate the way I do, um, having been born here, having, like many people, have uh, then moved elsewhere, uh, myself first to Canada, like many you know, people who immigrate elsewhere, uh, and then um, schooled elsewhere, and then returning back to Hong Kong. And um, it's a familiar story, but I think it's something that uh, I think testifies to uh, my own practice as a curator, but also uh, influences a lot of artists. And then, you know, you hear a lot about um, local Hong Kong artists. You hear a lot about how the international scene is entering into Hong Kong. But there's also sort of, I think, a contingent of people where it's sort of this hybrid. And I think it's all, um, uh, and how do you sort of articulate that? And that's something that I uh, bring into uh, my own practice. And I uh, increasingly, I think, as I am today, vocalizing it and acknowledging it as an influence. So um, maybe not the first place you want to start curating your first exhibition in sort of um, a very remote part of Toronto. Um, this is uh, Woodbridge, Ontario. It's an old uh, motor uh, sort of district a lot of sort of gas stations and such. But I had a wonderful opportunity to do my literally my first curated project when I didn't even know what curating was um, in a place called Motor Oil. Um, and I'll share some of the images first. So this was, uh, as you can see in the outside, there's a little uh, mask the inside, which was really a kind of the first of its kind. This is actually in the late 90s. Um, and essentially, this is a moment uh, where Toronto was becoming what was called a megacity. So it was sort of growing and changing. And I thought that was a kind of a similar to, you know, like many urban cities, but in particular what's happening with uh, Hong Kong right now. And uh, I have an ongoing interest in artists who deal with, you know, site, who deal with um, in particular kind of like, um, I guess, particularly urban environments, because I, you know, that's where I, I, I often work, not always, but... Uh, and so this sort of uh, was the seed that continues today where um, it was a series of commissions where I enabled um, artists to um, create new work to, in a sense, answer or react to the changes that were going on around them. And that um, became many things. You, you probably can't, and very sort of mixed in, so I'll just point them out. Uh, on the wall is a piece by Carlo Cesta, an Italian-Canadian um, artist who um, takes basically um, the wire, the wire intricate sort of uh, fencing of his neighborhoods and creates these kind of like sculptures out of them. There's like, like an 18 foot sign uh, by Peter Boyer, who's sort of like this empty marketing sort of insignia. And then the floor piece uh, was actually a um, piece by Eric Glavin, who's a painter, but sort of wanted to take those formats and then kind of uh, bridge them into this site specific piece, which is in essence transposing uh, mall uh, maps or architecture into uh, this sort of uh, other kind of space that was now uh, coming in. And um, as you'll see later, uh, even the documentation I tend to do uh, creates uh, is in tune with uh, the location. So this is a, I did a CD soundtrack and commissioned a sound artist to create um, a audio track that relates to uh, the, the uh, work. There was a second site also in the main city to do sort of these um, um, also programs. Uh, this is one of the pieces by uh, Toronto artist Karma Clark Davis. It was a film as a sort of homage to uh, being in, not being in Kansas, uh, sort of the idea of the um, um, alien in another space. So this was actually in the change room. So if you went into the change rooms, you would see this video. So sort of like coming upon art and seeing it in the everyday environment. Um, this is a project I did in, in 2003. And in essence, I'm giving you different examples of um, what you might call alternative sites. Uh, but what those might be, uh, well, I'll share many different types of examples and how artists have been, uh, I've encouraged artists to uh, create new work or they already work in this way. So I'm creating a context for them. Uh, this was a project called Subscribe. Uh, 
recent art in print, looking at artists who use uh, the print media as an alternative space for their work. Um, oftentimes this happens because there's uh, artists, uh, critics who want to sort of author their own history, uh, artists who are interested in popular culture, who uh, want to uh, sort of use this location, or um, the idea of published materials having um, an everyday circulation and really reaching um, everyone and many, many, many people. And it's for its access. So this is a, a subscription card by Dave Muller, American artist, and it was in Time Out <laughs> the week. And if you received that magazine, you got a free uh, piece of art. This is another um, advertisement by um, a Canadian artist, Ron Tarada from Vancouver. So what he did was in every place where there was a uh, project, he put an advertisement in the advertising section. And he's very known for doing that. He um, uh, uses text in uh, various ways, um, in various conceptual ways. And you'll see that in a different, um, it has a long history of that, whether that's advertising, signage, posters, and such. So the idea of the magazine is a perfect location for him. This was um, in 2004, uh, a sort of self-initiated project called Red Eye Projects. And it is, this was a web project called um, The One Liner. So this is by a Dutch artist, Mark Bile. And I can't show you the website anymore because it doesn't exist. But it was a year-long um, overtake by different artists uh, using, uh, in text-based forms, taking over uh, the website, an early, maybe an earlier example of uh, the internet art. Um, this was another Red Eye project called uh, Video Box. This was the exhibition component. This is um, French artist Laurent Monteron, who uh, it was a various uh, videos uh, as part of with White Box, a nonprofit in New York, and they played videos on the street. And then this was a culminated in an exhibition uh, where uh, there were several different. We associated with several different actually galleries and. Um, in uh, the Chelsea district and created these uh, projections. And this is, um, as in the introduction, sort of where I am now, <laughs> um, or the little bit of a history of where I am now. This uh, is Forever and Today Inc., which is I'm the co-founder, co-director, and uh, co-curator, along with uh, Savannah Gordon, who is uh, also the curator of Friends with Books, an art book fair in Berlin. And together, when we were in New York, we um, created Forever and Today Inc., which um, the mandate is we're a nonprofit commissioning organization, and we um, commission new work by a single artist, a collective, or a collaborative entity. And what that means is that we work one on one with an artist. They may choose to work with other people, we work one on one. There are no group shows. And we really, what I like to say, don't put art in a space, we put space around the work and create the platforms that um, um, allow artists to sort of do the projects they wish. Um, this was our storefront in Chinatown in 2008. We had it for about four years in Lower East Side Chinatown, on right by Canal Street, Ludlow, and yeah, really at the heart. And it, as you can tell by the, it looks pretty modest. It was modest. It was literally 100 square feet but fully renovated, as you might, the gallery. So, <laughs> um, And it provided really wonderful context to do many projects. Uh, this is the nighttime shot of uh, Marco Lulich, a Viennese artist who did this uh, yeah, tapestry. Uh, this is a piece by Kevin Zucker and Heather Rowe, um, two artists who wanted to work together. This afforded them that possibility. And it was a response to a shuttered theater across the street that was being turned into a um, performing arts center. And they sort of really reimagined what it would be like inside. So it's just like very intricate construction. But really, it was about light, cinema, and the idea of this kind of experience still of that, that kind of engagement, and literally reflecting that across the street with their own project. And as you can tell, we had many people come in. It was free and open to the public, free access. You know, we um, constructed it with local materials. We, you know, engaged all local businesses. So... That was very important to us as a um, nonprofit, you know, in this era of thinking through. I mean, even many, I won't get into them deep, but 
there's lots of contentious issues around gentrification, as there always is. But what we wanted to do with our organization, which is why it was so small, why we use local materials, which is why we, you know, engaged uh, local organizations to do educational programs, um, is that we really wanted to not just theorize on the ideas of it or, you know, wait for protests, but really um, try and answer the question. How do you create a cultural space that would be... Um, meet the artist's demands in terms of what they're trying to do, but also be um, cognizant of what we know sometimes cultural um, spaces or any kinds of spaces um, uh, do to uh, neighborhoods. Um, I thought this was a nice project to speak of, given, um, I think, yesterday's presentation. Um, this was a, a project we did with a Chinese artist, O Zhang. And um, I, if you want, I can give you the titles, and I haven't been giving the titles, but some of them are quite long. Um, but this is called A Splendid Future for the Past, and a lot of artists um, engaged in the neighborhood about what kinds of spaces were there. And uh, there's a lots of sort of um, spaces for prayer, and uh, her project revolved around um, honoring people that had died unnaturally in the Chinatowns of New York, and um, through these small um, rabbits she was already fostering. Uh, I will say we worked right from the get-go with the um, House Rabbit Society of New York to sort of figure out the right um, conditions to house these uh, her, her sort of pets. And in line with the project as well, the idea that um, in, in sort of honoring the spirits that at the end of the project, uh, the uh, rabbits would get adopted. And one did get adopted by a family in Connecticut and if you want to visit the other one, the one, the other one, she actually lives with me. So she's just in Saiwan. <laughs> she's been with me for about eight years. And she, it's a true testament about how art can change your life because she literally changed mine in so many ways. Um, anyhow, this was a project with uh, Alison Knowles, fantastic artist. She is a founding member of the Fluxus Movement. And this was a collaboration with Performa. And we did a uh, live performance. And I bring this up because um, it was, uh, like I said, a very tiny room. But we ha she, did, she, um, she doesn't, it's not a, uh, it's, she says that she performs new, her works new every time. Uh, so they're not, they're not redone projects. So this is a, a piece, uh, she did one about shoes, she did one about paper. Her um, husband was, her late husband was a well-known printer of fluxes. This is her daughter, her granddaughter performed. And it was a real family environment, uh, which I was really intriguing because if you look at her research, research her work, there's never anything written about that connection. And we, uh, Savannah and I found that very interesting. And that's something I've carried here um, because there's a lot, there's a different kind of connection I think that artists have with their families here. And it's quite acknowledged. Um, you know, artists with their children or including them or, um, and I think that has to do with a lot of things, in, including some, in, including space and how people just live in general. But um, I found that really interesting. And that's something that I've carried over from this project to Hong Kong and how I'm thinking about uh, the way in which artists practice maybe a little differently um, here than elsewhere. Um, this, I wish I could play this one. Um, but maybe we can find a way to do that a little later. This is another sort of um, ar artist who's had stopped for a long time. This is uh, American artist Jack Early. He was active in the, more active in the um, late 80s. Um, you might know his uh, former duo partner, uh, Rob Pruitt. There used to be a duo called Pruitt Early. Um, and then they, he stopped making work for about a decade. Uh, so this was the first uh, piece, uh, one of the first pieces he did after 10 years, really just not making work at all. And it was a film that we commissioned from him. Um, it's like a music video. And it's, um, even though it's film, it's, and it's very sort of Frank Sinatra-like, it's really a self-portrait about uh, kind of um, redemption, about, you know, the pain that artists go through. And it's, it, it's, and it's very, actually, also a very catchy song. Um, so I can share that uh, with, with um, everyone a little later. 
This is by um, a Hong Kong, I think, I think it was born, now American artist, um, Christopher K. Ho. Sometimes he, he comes back and forth. He was just in the Parasite exhibition. Uh, and it was a show called Privileged White People. So it was looking at sort of the uh, rise of uh, political um, um, consciousness in a certain era um, of American politics during the Clinton um, generation. Uh, and the little uh, diagram on the right was an addition. We also did um, additioned work. So we gave away art for free often. We tried to really um, engage different audiences. This was uh, an installation. We did a, in this one, we did also a program with the Museum of Chinese in America uh, where we um, collaborated. It, it was a screenplay, so we did sort of this live um, act uh, with him as part of uh, this project. And also this um, represents a guest curatorial program we had. So out of this little tiny space, we had, um, yeah, exhibitions, uh, programs, performances, a guest, curating pro guest curator program, um, artist books as well. Um, this was a case where we invited one artist who invited another art uh, academic, and then it was 100 contributors. So sometimes it grows. Uh, this is by um, an artist, uh, Colombian-born American artist, Carlos Mota, and it's called um, Petite Mort, Recollections of a Queer Public, where it is the um, remembrances, hand-drawn remembrances of um, encounters between men in New York City. So it's sort of like, uh, and it's all compiled and uh, she was a very popular book. So, and not just the drawings, there was also um, academics, people writing about sort of the, the, the sort of the history of certain spaces and, and, um, and contextualizing what maybe seemed like um, only, um, public encounters as they see it as forms of community building. So that was sort of the way in which this, uh, car, the artist and the, his uh, collaborator wanted to um, contextualize this project. It, the storefront was also a residency program. So we tried to take sort of the cycles of art, like the, you know, the lull in the summer, and we gave our space up to an artist to use as their studio. Uh, this is the uh, this is Liz Magic Laser who turned her space into um, a TV studio, and you can see her like literally working here. And the clocks represent the project she had ongoing at the time. Um, this was she was then we were then invited to do a, a performance at Swiss Institute um, through Gianni Jetzer at the time, and um, she essentially it was called the Living Newspaper. And as you can see, quite literally, taking the headlines of the day and uh, through public um, engagement and public performance, uh, they sort of enacted uh, headlines of the day, which are still, sadly, headlines of today. Uh, this is, you know, several, several years ago. Um, and uh, I, won't, yeah, I won't play the video here. Um, I can share any links you'd like to see. So uh, through this, she was also invited by CNN. This was uh, the moment of, I think, uh, Obama's second term um, election. And she did a, a video around uh, using the locations around uh, Forever and Today to um, do videos and uh, interviews. And because uh, like many artists, you know, she'll take things and record things. And they may not turn out to be something she'll use now, but maybe later. So uh, we tried to sort of enable that for artists as well, for them just to work, and then to be able to um, do other things uh, with, with the time that they've spent at, an, at a future date. Um, this was just as we were leaving our storefront, and in fact, leaving New York. Uh, this, is a, this is the West Best Center for the Arts. And uh, I think some artists here might recognize it because I think there's this residency program um, in this building. Um, but uh, actually, um, some of our, our speakers today, Septima, you would appreciate this. Um, it's, it's the home of Martha Graham's studio. It was a long time um, um, headquarters for um, a lot of other sort of uh, performers. Um, and so we took this over uh, through a comp. We also collaborated with um, um, organizations that invited us. So this was a citywide project with the French consulate, and we invited a Parisian artist, Marc Geffrio, who um, recently showed in Hong Kong as well. 
Uh, and so I can't show you the film, but it was this really beautiful take on how the building um, historically had been used for um, industrial purposes and um, fit a lot of uh, in, um, film, uh, yeah, sort of elements in film. And so he wanted to take that history and create this um, film that, so the building really became the subject of the work. And then through this film, he should have shared um, the, again, this idea of using the coin as a way to evoke, you know, this, the, the implied sense of what happens when, you, you know, when you're in the cinema and the, the sort of magic of film. Um, this is Slavs and Tatars, and it was an installation we did. Uh, I've worked with them several times. Uh, this was the one we, we did in New York called Never Give Up the Fruit. Um, and it was looking at the um, Uyghur region of uh, China. They do sort of a, um, they do a research cycles. And so they were looking at this fable of the fragrant concubine who um, essentially never gave up the fruit. So they take these, you know, they really investigate, you know, these sometimes these very tough um, 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 situations and, uh, you know, difficult subject matter, as artists often do, but they translate it in an accessible way. So the idea of fruit became quite literal, and then we created this, commissioned this installation from them. This isn't our space. It was then showed, I guess, an example of how several of our uh, projects then went on to um, PS1 and other museums. Um, this was their, like, literally glass bulbs lights that are meant to evoke uh, the hammy melon, which you probably have seen in your grocery store. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, I think it's just simulation, it's the Chinese uh, wood um, characters. So now we're in Hong Kong. And how have I bridged some of these projects into uh, what I'm doing here and what I hope to do um, in the future? Um, as some of you may know, some of you may not, uh, for the last three years, I was the uh, public programs curator at Asia Art Archive. And uh, through that, um, I did many things, but I'll share with you a few um, particular uh, programs um, that I initiated. Uh, this is the bridge with Slavs and Tatars. I invited them as residents. And this is a survey exhibition of their 10 years of publishing. Um, they're quite well known now for the sculptures that you see, but publishing is also important to them. Um, and of course, being in a library, it was the perfect place to share that. But it became a question, a curatorial conundrum about how do you then do a survey of publications? Uh, as you can tell, publishing is a very uh, ongoing interest for me um, as a medium. So we did this kind of like presentation of uh, their work. And these are all of their materials from, you know, posters, ephemera, books, et cetera, um, that were shared in the library uh, for a number of months, uh, a book sculpture. So when they're finished with their cycle of research, they spear their research materials and it becomes a sculpture. Um, this, I thought, was a, a fun example to share in Hong Kong. Uh, this was a part of a larger program for the 15th anniversary of uh, Asia Art Archive, and I wanted to... For the moment, for that small period of time, kind of take away, maybe pare down the words and the footnotes and the books and the bindings and kind of reach in and like um, see what's inside the pages of the archive and the artist and what, what does that art really look like. So we have, um, and what did I find? You know, I searched in the audio archives, I searched in other archives. And uh, we also have tote bags. So I did a, this is called a short history of the art book bag and the things that go in them. So from paper uh, to collaborations, as we see now, you know, with artists and, um, and uh, I guess, corporate and brands we see all the time. But it was actually looking at it in a historical way. But really what it was about was to uh, trace um, use this sort of popular form of the bag as a way to look at issues of globalism, look at the issues of ways in which, um, you know, before uh, the sort of influx of people have been in more and more coming, coming to Hong Kong, like 
you would usually just see it through the bags, the advertising, the symposiums, or the uh, biennials, triennials, et cetera. So it's sort of like looking at that history through this kind of innocuous, uh, a different kind of frame, and the frame happened to be the bag, and the things that go in them are, you know, whatever content you choose. So it was sort of a fun way to um, look at um, uh, look at that that history, um, and also uh, what I was seeing around me. So the you probably can't see it. The grid system is an homage to like the hawker stalls in Hong Kong. I was investigating the idea of exhibition histories in terms of. Um, ecology, could the materials we use be returned, you know, into the environment? So it became sort of a, a, a sort of a curatorial endeavor on my part. So things that I'm beginning to think about as well, uh, hopefully in the future and projects that I do. Uh, this is Open Platform 2015, where we were able to um, commission an architect to create a platform for uh, discussions of the day, what was happening in Asia. Um, and this was, I guess, my last big project uh, just happened this past January. Uh, this is called the editorial. And this is the, dis the table, the sort of setup. This is the, um, the performances we had. And essentially, it was looking at artist publishing in the region. And um, it was a marketplace looking at the form of the art book fair, this burgeoning practice. Um, you're seeing these zine fairs, book fairs, things pop up in Asia. So it's actually look, taking a look at um, what was happening. And then we then we turned the, you know, the day the daytime. It was a discussion forum. The nighttime, it was a performance um, and that. And then all of the materials then came back to AAA for um, a program I called Free Parking Art Libraries from Elsewhere where we bring materials in direct contact with um, um, publishing um, in the region and kind of literally having a conversation um, in terms of maybe one history versus another or just, you know, like literally the materials having a dialogue with each other. And I'm happy to say that the materials, um, one of our um, contributors to the program was David Senior, who then was at MoMA. Um, the MoMA has a long, long history of uh, working with published materials, um, Clive Philpott is a very important um, librarian slash curator before David Sr., who's now at um, SF MoMA, heading their archives. Uh, but through him, uh, he generously offered, and now the, all these materials are available in the Museum of Modern Art Library. So now more people will be able to access um, uh, mit, uh, artist uh, thinking, books, writing from the region. And um, again, I can't play the video, but I wanted to share a few examples of, that I found very intriguing of uh, public projects or projects set uh, in, in Hong Kong. One I'm sure you know very well, uh, Kingsley Ng's um, 20 Minutes Older, and where he turned this you know, tram first uh, before art, the Art Basel uh, program. He did, a, I actually went to the initial uh, project. And he basically turned it into the uh, this sort of camera where you went in. So I just thought that was really, really fantastic in terms of um, the simplicity with which, I mean, I'm sure it's a much more complex project, but it ended up feeling very simple to really um, give everybody, anybody who wanted to come, um, a really, kind of, I think, deep experience with um, reimagining their city. Uh, so it sort of goes back to my early, my very, maybe my very first project I explained about, about how it doesn't take much to just sort of, you can use what you have around you. And, uh, and, and of course, through artists, it just can become something amazing. Um, this is a, I sort of wanted to share, this represents many small spaces in Hong Kong. This is Holy Motors, some of you may have seen. This is a project with Adrian Wong. Um, and sorry, I just want to, I want to make sure I, I uh, mention his collaborator. Let me see if I have it well. Oh, I will find it. But um, it's the, I guess the more important thing is that it's uh, sort of like, it reminded me, I guess, of Forever and Today. It's just a small window, but it's a very, very effective space. Um, there's a little gathering space you can sort of engage in. Um, but of course, it's on hiatus. Um, it, along with many other small um, projects, and um, in, it, for now in Shamshai Po, uh, like 
many of you know, things that can happen or 100 foot park or, you know, these are all amazing spaces, but, you know, you could really replace these names because there's a sort of a, um, a lifespan that these spaces have. And I guess one thing, uh, having worked with, uh, continuing to work with Forever and Today, and, and I guess my heart is in, in, in non-institutional locations, as you can probably see, uh, what's become, I think, increasingly important is to sort of take the history that I've learned from my experience with AA and, and try to sort of do something on the ground, something real that's going to help artists uh, be a bridge to um, the institutions, um, the amazing things that are going to happen to Hong Kong with the museums that are coming. But it can't, uh, for me, it can't be the only kind of space because that's not how all artists work. It's not how all curators work. And it uh, hopefully, um, through our discussion today, we can explore some examples about how uh, we can support artists and, and all cultural practitioners in many ways. And so that uh, there's a sort of a rich um, ecology that we can continue to build um, in the city that we love. So with that, um, thank you. Oh, so I wanted to um, invite every of these, uh, our panelists up. And since they've already been introduced, I won't introduce them again. Uh, but if they want to come up, and then um, for in the order that we have, we'll have them give um, short uh, presentations. And then we'll have a, uh, a moderate discussion and any questions and answers about their experiences with uh, non-institutional sites. Thank you.